Welcome to Homeschool Mama Self-Care. I'm Teresa Wiedrich from Capturing the Charmed Life. I'm here to help you turn your homeschool challenges into your homeschool charms. If you are a homeschool mama challenged by doubt, not sure that you can do this homeschool thing, if you're a homeschool mama challenged by overwhelm, there are just too many things to do, or you are a homeschool mama that isn't clear on what nurturing the nurturer looks like in real time, then this is the podcast for you. Today, I get to introduce you to Kimberly Sharon. Kimberly is a busy, creative homeschooling geek mom of two who believes in out-of-the-box thinking and doing what you love. She's been serving the homeschool community by providing homeschool information and coaching at homeschoolinginnovascotia.com since 2008. Since she especially loves to share her family's geek schooling adventures, she started geekschoolingguide.com, dedicated to ending your frustrations with your obsessed, geeky child and helping you enjoy easy, delight-directed learning with them, centered on their passions and fandoms. She's also a certified online business manager, working with coaches, consultants, and authors. In her free time, she likes to perform and direct local theater. She hand spins, knits, and reads. Welcome, Kimberly. So I am so glad that you're here and I officially get to meet you in person on Zoom instead of on Facebook. (laughs) Face to face. Face face to face. Yeah, it's lovely to meet you. Today's been such a busy day with a Canadian online homeschool conference and all Mm. sorts of different things. But I would love to hear what's going on in your world these days and tell me a little bit about your homeschool story. What's going on? Well, I'm speaking at a lot of conferences lately (laughs) and uh, that's always fun. Um, I really enjoy that. Um, In our homeschool, we're preparing our daughter for uh, going to post-secondary in fall. So she's just finished applying to all of the post-secondary institutions that she wants to and we're um, waiting to hear. And uh, she had to videotape all of her dance auditions because this is a pandemic time. So she didn't get to do any of them in person, but I think she had fun doing it. And uh, I'm really proud of her because she did about 90% of it herself. Um, all of the prep and all of the sending and everything. I just yes. got the records together. So I was really proud of her for that. I know a lot of, you know, grade 12s, their their parents end up doing the whole thing for them pretty much. So that's pretty normal, right? Um, so I was proud of her. for. She made all her lists. She checked them twice. <laughs> so, um, so that's been a big, big part of our homeschool and life right now. Um, is, that's uh, where we have it in common right now is that our um, both our kids are going towards a similar direction this is my second daughter um, who's also going towards a dance and she was literally just accepted as I started talking with you today <laughs> but um, my experience I was just sharing this on a live as well that my experience with homeschool high school kids is they're very independent and um, though the idea as a homeschool mom is super daunting that we're taking on this role, um, you know, doing something so out of the element and it's such like a preparatory time for their adulthood. The reality is that they're very independent and they know how to do their thing and they do exactly. My two did exactly what your child did too, is I want to manage this. I will talk to the admissions dean and I will submit. And I'm like, okay, I guess I prepped them for this, right? Go for it. Yeah, Yeah, you go, girl. So where did you get started with your homeschooling? Well, um, my son is 22 now. And uh, when he was two, I started looking at all the different types of schooling. And um, I attended an information session with Gail Hanlon, who's been a great friend for 20 years now. And this was back in Ontario. And uh, I really, I really wanted to do to homeschool. Um, it was just, it was just him at the time because they're about four or five years apart, the two of them. And uh, my husband was like, well, why don't we give school a try? And um, so we didn't do what was JK, junior kindergarten in Ontario at the time, because we knew, I mean, we thought of it as glorified babysitting really. 
Um, there wasn't a lot going on in the JK classroom, at least not at the time. <laughs> we didn't even visit a school. But um, so we wanted to challenge him because he was quite bright. He was playing chess at three. And so we put him into a French immersion uh, school. And because that was an option in Ontario, you can, you can choose a French immersion school. He was still bored anyway. He didn't particularly like the French. He, you know, scribbled instead of doing his, you know, like the teacher didn't know he was capable of anything because he just, eh, I don't want to do this. <laughs> Although she, she did recognize some things. His greatest joy the whole year was when she realized he knew all about money. And so he stood at the front of the classroom and taught everybody all about money. <laughs> he thought that was great. But that was probably the only time he enjoyed himself, unfortunately, in the classroom. And uh, he ended up being bullied. And the, the girls would chase him around. At, this wasn't the bullying part. But the girls would chase him around at recess with chapstick. And he, he just didn't understand why kids were so weird. <laughs> you know, <laughs> weird and wanted to do things like that. Uh, and one time when he was being bullied, he got so upset um, that he actually ended up punching the child and so he ended up in um, the principal's office because you know that's what happens <laughs> so um we made him stick it out the whole year which in retrospect I should have just told him because I had by that point I had an infant daughter so every morning I was going out to the car because we had to drive to the French Immersion School it wasn't you know there were no buses for that and um you know, I had my daughter in my arm and I was trying to wrangle my six-year-old son by that time to get him into the car and he did not want to go. Yeah. So he would like hang, hang on to the door handle screaming and no, I don't want to go. So sometimes we didn't make it because I just couldn't, you know, then my daughter's screaming and we're, <laughs> we're all having fun, you know. So sometimes we just, we just didn't go to school because um, it just wasn't possible for me to get him there. So we from then on, we homeschooled him. By then, my husband saw that, yeah, it was, you know, the right idea. So he, he was homeschooled from grade one, doesn't even really remember that year in senior kindergarten. Um, but yeah, so between him being bored and the bullying, it was just not, not right. So what was your first year like? Um, well, we, uh, I, I always loved the well-trained mind. So we loosely followed the well-trained mind. Um, and, you know, I, I always took it in stride though. I never really stressed about not getting certain things done or getting everything in, in there done. Um, and we went with his passions and we did a lot of, you know, playing with Greeks and Romans and things like that with, uh, Playmobil um because he just loved Playmobil we'd go off on tangents with all sorts of different um things like Star Wars and uh, get immersed in that or you know Lord of the Rings or whatever he happened to be into so we we were pretty relaxed from the start I also did was the well-trained yeah, you also did the well-trained mind. I did, but <laughs> I didn't do it in a I didn't do it in a relaxed way. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, we didn't stay with that for more than a couple years. <laughs> well, I was heavily influenced by Gail, and she was an art schooler, and I knew, you know, that her her family was doing amazingly well, and that kids learn and they learn through everything. So I, that's why I, I wasn't stressing and. Um, and, you know, my, my son was pretty funny because at age four, he, he said, okay, I want to learn how to, how to read. So I said, okay. So, you know, we went full throttle, learning how to read. And then he said, ah, I don't want to read anymore. Yeah. So <laughs> he, he, did, he did that with potty training too. <laughs> so I thought he was potty trained. And ah, I don't want to be a potty trained anymore. Yeah. And it was a while until he was ready again. So he wasn't ready again until he was eight and, um, and that was okay. And then he just, and then he just read everything within a very short period of time. Cause he decided he wanted to learn to read. So. Yeah. Your son sounds similar to my son too. Cause by the time my son was two, 
I was no longer winning the chess game. <laughs> I, I uh, didn't know what they were. I called them horsey at the time and I would bug him and my husband by you <laughs> referring to them, the pieces in the wrong names, but he was naturally very good. Just like you're saying, I was always just listening to a, a seminar from this um, Canadian online homeschool conference about gifted kids and he, your son sounds like he might be gifted or did you ever go down that path of trying to figure those sorts of things? We out? never got him tested. Um, yeah. We never got him tested. I wouldn't be surprised if he was gifted in some manner. Um, it wasn't typical per se, because he was never a huge math whiz or anything like that. So maybe an atypical kind of thing, but um, he did have um, dysgraphia. So writing oh. was really tough for him. Um, so he learned to type very early on instead of writing. We didn't stress about him writing. And uh, I mean, he's since worked, worked in a kitchen for three years and all sorts of different things. So, I mean, he had to write things down. He, he got by okay. <laughs> Man, I wish I had your, your um, approach or had a mentor like you did right off the top as a homeschool mom to say, relax, you know, like, or whatever it was she was telling you to say, it's okay, whatever you're doing, it, because that is, that's really powerful. It's hard to go, like I, my oldest was finishing grade two, and I had such a mindset of there's a certain way we have to do an education, and I can do it just as well or better than the school. And so I did what you did, but with less relaxation <laughs> and uh and the kids remember that too and it was not fun and I stressed all of us out because of it my expectations were wildly unrealistic and in the end I came to the same place you are <laughs> is that okay well yeah we'll try to enable them to have as much stimulation and allow them to follow you know I would call it sort of a self-directed learning approach except that I'm somewhat directing things as well um, but mostly I allow them to do their thing but when we do that they learn so much they learn on their own timeline just like your son you know he's just following what he's following when it fits and it makes sense to him there actually there's so many people aren't there that talk about late readers and when they do start reading then just boom they're in they start reading everything yeah, there's a dirty little secret. You don't really have to teach someone how to read. They can learn on their own. Now, that being said, it's super fun to teach them. Um, and I had a <laughs> whole lot of fun teaching my daughter um, and I'm teaching my son when he wanted to learn. Well, initially, when he was four, we had tons of fun. But <laughs> uh, he just taught himself when he was eight. But uh, but yeah, my daughter, you know, I mean, we had a lot of fun. And it was it was an absolute thrill for her to just, you know, start reading off the milk carton, the words, you know, one day. And it was like, oh, yay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I know my oldest, I was so worried that she, I had heard she had this grade one teacher that was challenging or difficult. So I thought, well, we'll make sure she reads before she goes into grade one, which entirely stressed her out. And it didn't get her reading faster. Um, my second started when she was five on her own. My third started whole word reading when she was four. So when I started phonics, I was like, wait, what? You're, you're not allowed to do whole word reading. And then my youngest, I thought, well, finally, now I have a boy. So he'll probably be like, 17 or something I don't know something outrageous anyways in his reading but he was six and just like your guy just started reading everything at that point and six isn't late anyway yeah our expectations sometimes of what we think it's supposed to be like can be really intense and put yeah. so much pressure on ourselves more than anybody our kids too it helps to be around other homeschoolers I mean even just online um who I, I knew I knew a lot of homeschoolers whose kids hadn't started reading till 11 and the parents weren't freaking out. They just went with the flow until they, you know, until they got it, until they wanted to. Um, so yeah, that, you know, you don't have to stress out about reading. It will happen. You know, it's, it's kind of like breastfeeding. Um, you know, they're not going to still be breastfeeding when they're 17. They will be. <laughs> and uh, they'll, they'll learn to read. <laughs> yeah, Unless that's you Unless, of course, you see signs of them, you know, actually having yeah. sort of um, learning disability, in which case you've got to watch for those kind of signs. But yeah, most of the time they'll learn. So you've been homeschooling for how many years in total? 16. 
16. Yeah. And so your daughter, your youngest, so you have two and your second one is about to graduate this year. Yes. So I'm at the end of my homeschool journey. Yeah. But not at the end of helping other homeschoolers. I'll still be coaching homeschoolers. So. Yeah, that's a beautiful combination. So, you know, this idea that we sometimes we're doing this homeschool mom thing for so long. So then we create an identity around it, which is, of course, it's an identity. And at the same time, we are transitioning out of it all at the same time. But somewhere along that way, you got into coaching and encouraging homeschool moms. Will you tell me about that? Yeah, in 2008, I started a website because, um, you know, people needed help. And uh, um, so I started helping people here in Nova Scotia, because by that time, I was in Nova Scotia. So that's homeschooling in Nova Scotia.com. And uh, I've been running that ever since and helping, you know, coach local homeschoolers and give them the right information. Um, so often, and I know this happens in other provinces too, but so often teachers think they know all sorts of things. They think they know the law. They think it's, it's this way and it's completely not that way at all. They, they, they don't know at all, but they think they know. So they say it authoritatively. Oh, you can't homeschool because, um, or the principal of the school says, something like that and so or the school board which we're, we don't even deal with the school board here we deal directly with the department of education actually or the department of education gives them incorrect information that happens too um so i you know it there was a definite need especially when i first moved here because there was somebody in the department of education answering the phones and telling people they couldn't go to school so that wasn't good. <laughs> um, so they would come to me and say, what's going on? Because they would be able to find me or somebody would tell them about me. So I was once at a table full of um, teachers having lunch and they were telling me all sorts of things. By that time, I had been te- I had been homeschooling for like eight years or something like that, eight, ten years. And um, they were telling me all sorts of things that I had to do as a homeschooler. And I was saying, no, no, that's not a lot. They're like, oh, yes, it is. It's a lot. <laughs> it was hilarious. But I mean, can you imagine, you know, somebody who is not homeschooling and, you know, thinking about it and gets all of, you know, sitting at a table full of teachers and gets this kind of misinformation. And, you know, I mean, the, the teachers think they know, but they don't. Um, and people need to know the actual information. That it's actually easy to homeschool here in Nova Scotia. And it was really easy to homeschool in Ontario. I love that Ontario, um, you know, if, you, if your child is in school, you have to um, tell the principal, hey, you know, we're withdrawing, you know, or the school board. But that's it. Um, otherwise, there's nothing else that you have to do. I love that. Um, it was a bit of <laughs> it was a bit of a, a transition to come here and have to uh, submit a registration and then a report at the end of the year. But it's it's not a big deal, and a lot of people think they have to submit you know a big book of things you know at the beginning and the end of the year, and you really don't. You really just need to fill out the registration form, a couple of sentences each subject, and then you know the report is literally a report card. So your subject great or subject you know, um, they're mastering everything they need to know, which we, we've never given grades. So, um, of course, I awarded grades for um, the purpose of a high school transcript, but I never talk to my children about the grades. They just, they get what they get, and we don't talk to them about, oh, your grades aren't good, or yeah. <laughs> whatever. Um, it's never a stressor for them, because they just, they just learn. So tell me what your experience has been like throughout your homeschool journey. I've found that um, one of the biggest experiences or the learning curves I've had in homeschooling wasn't about socialization and it wasn't about academics, even although I've learned a lot, but it was more about learning about me and my kids become my mini mirrors. Yeah, not my mini me's, 
my many mirrors. And then I'm seeing myself in their eyes. I'm learning so much about myself. And I'm curious at what you've learned about yourself or about your needs throughout your homeschool journey. Um, I, I guess I've learned, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not surprising because I was a, a very good student, but I guess I've learned that I really love learning. Um, and when I was a student in school, I played the game, I, um, the game of education in the public school system is uh, cram and then dump. Um, so it was, you know, memorize everything and then, you know, and then dump it afterwards because you don't need it again. Uh, and that that's not actually how you learn. So um, I didn't do very well in university because that doesn't work as well in university. And I was not prepared. Nobody prepared me for university. Um, so nobody told me what it was like or that, um, you know, you have to really, it's a, a full-time job. You know, for school, you should be spending 40 hours a week, including your course time and everything else. I had no clue. I had no preparation. <laughs> so I, you know, um, I've made sure that my kids know, uh, you know, what, what to be prepared for. But uh, yeah, I, I learned that I really love to learn and I really love history, which is not something I really enjoyed learning in high school or, yeah, or you know, or elementary. Um, and in elementary school, we spent um, basically every year learning the same thing in history and social studies, which wasn't fun. Yeah. <laughs> Here I was, I wanted to learn about the Greeks and the Romans, the ancient Egyptians. We never got to learn any of that ever. My entire university career, there wasn't a single course that you could take on that. So it was nice. Um, we spent a lot of time on that. Luckily, my kids thought that was fascinating too. So we spent a lot of time on that in their homeschool. And like I said, they love the Playmobil, um, all the little Playmobil sets. And we learned about the Romans while we played Playmobil Romans. But, yeah, I um, actually find that we can include all of our interests in homeschooling. It doesn't have hmm. to be what do the kids learn or, you know, what do I do in my spare time? I can actually incorporate my interests in our actual homeschool days, which is super fun. Absolutely. And I've had people ask me, well, you know, how can I make sure I don't force my, you know, my interests on them? And I'm like, yeah, why, why don't you think you're forcing <laughs> your interests on them? Go it's, ahead and share them. That's yeah. how they find their interests. I mean, they may not share them and that's fine. You can move on. Right. They might. Or they're exposed to it and then they identify you with going to art galleries. That's me anyways. Um, We're not going anywhere these days, but, you know, going to art galleries or anything fun like that. That's my kind of fun. And, you know, they learn that that's mom's thing, impressionist art or you, ancient Greek and ancient Roman history, right? Well, more theater than any of that. We just enjoy doing that. But yeah, my my kids learned pretty early on that uh, that mom is really into theater, um, and we we got them into theater at a young age too, and uh, and they enjoyed it as well. Um, and and it's something I put on hold until my daughter was about three. So I had this big, you know, uh, was it a decade? I think of of no theater. Um, no acting, no directing, no, you know, no, no being in the theater. So it was nice to go back to it. And I think it was nice to, for my kids to see mom doing something like that. Um, so yeah, I mean, theater is part of my self care because I'm, I'm an extrovert. So it very much feeds my needs as an extrovert. And um, it's, uh, it's severely lacking right now because <laughs> I can't do theater, but uh yeah, that is really it, tricky for the art community in general, isn't it? This year has been, they're definitely one of the people or the groups that's had the hardest time, I think. The live, yeah, I, yeah, a lot of people I know, um, a lot of the dance schools around here have, um, have closed. Um, they, they've been open on and off, and then when they're open, they're at a reduced capacity, and they've just found it so hard. Some of them have folded. Um, yeah, and, and, you know, the film industry has been having some trouble. Um, my son's involved in the film industry. Um, and it's been, it's been pretty tough. You know, it's been open on and off and this restrictions have been fluctuating. 
and uh, and now you have to take uh, a COVID test four days before you go to set. And so there's a lot, <laughs> it's a lot. And yeah, the, um, my daughter was supposed to be in a professional theater, uh, musical theater production last summer, but they had to cancel it and they're hoping to do it this summer. I don't think it's gonna happen. Um, right. So it's, it's been really tough. And I know that the theater has been struggling, um, that particular theater um, and all the theaters. Um, luck, luckily, the one that we volunteer with the most, the Pond Playhouse, is, um, you know, it's an entirely volunteer organization, like top to bottom. There's not a single paid person. Um, so that's helpful because we don't have to pay any staff. But, you know, all of the other theaters are having a lot of trouble. And it's, um, yeah, we feel, we feel really bad for the performing arts sector right now yeah me too so how do you include that like when you were doing it how did you bring your homeschooled kids there or like how did you include it in your day so that you had time to do those sorts of things yeah well um we're largely unschoolers I say largely because there's some things that you know I end up directing like you were saying you yeah know, you do, you do direct some things I do direct some things but we are largely unschoolers and a lot of our we often look like a performing arts school um (laughs) so you know in our heyday when you know both kids were in theater and dance um we were on the move seven days a week Mm -hmm. you're never in the house (laughs) um and it was great that we were homeschooling because we could do all of these performances and oftentimes we were together as a family. Uh, Sometimes all four of us, we we pulled um, my husband into things too. And he started to get in theater, which is funny because he's not, you know, originally he wasn't into theater, but we pulled him in and he's maybe more, I think he, yeah, he definitely clocks more hours uh, volunteering for a local theater than I do now. So that's a cool thing that's happened. It's awesome. Um, but yeah, we found it was great because we do, um, you know, the kids shows at, um, you know, the local university or, or any of the community theaters. And they were, you know, at 10 or 11 in the morning. And then um, all the all the other kids would go back to school and and you know I would say day off we have you know week off during performances you know because it's tiring so we just go home and relax and watch tv or whatever you know and just have a week off anytime we were in a big performance like that and um when my daughter was nine she was in she was Cosette young Cosette in uh, Les Mis oh nice and, yeah. yeah, that was exhausting. Yeah. So I can't even imagine trying to get her to school. It would, yeah. she would have been like sick for a week or, but well, we were, on, I think we ran that for more than a week. But anyway, for the whole time, she would have, she would have probably been off sick from school because yeah. it, it was a lot. I mean, she yeah. loved it, absolutely loved it. But yeah, we were all in that, um, except for my husband. Uh, and it was it was a dream come true because I never thought I would be in Lane is I saw it on Broadway and I you know I wanted to run up and join them but I didn't know I'd ever be in a production myself and I was just thrilled our family has done a lot of theater as well just like what you're saying community theater or some sort of youth theaters or we even did like it's kind of like a homeschool co-op but it was theaters for the community we did that for years as well and it's not born out of my desire to perform um (laughs) very introverted husband actually was part of it just like you we pulled our, our my husband into it at some point and his passion is Broadway. He loves Broadway theater. So all my kids know the lyrics of Hamilton. I'm sure many people's kids know Hamilton, but you know, the lyrics of Hamilton, we went to see Simply Rotten in New York City. And then we, we saw um, uh, Lion King last year in Spokane. And I can't remember all the things that we've seen, but because of his interest and at the same time, he loves Super Bowl. We're going to watch, um, or he loves NFL. We're going to watch Super Bowl this this Saturday, but 
yeah so we actually have a lot of similarities our families a lot of performing and a lot of chess and a lot of smart kids it sounds like yeah yeah so so the performing arts has been a huge huge part of our homeschool um and the other thing that um we found was that our kids enjoyed our geeky pursuits too because my husband and I are very much geeks so um we were thrilled and uh so, you know, we, we were, you know, cooking, cook, baking cookies and making Death Star cakes and, you know, everything like that. And so I, I called it geek schooling on my original website, Homeschooling Nova Scotia. And then I thought, well, you know, not only people who are homeschooling in Nova Scotia might like geek schooling. So I started my geek schooling website and uh, we've had a lot of fun with that. Um, we've, we've enjoyed going to um, Halcon, our local um, convention, for 10 years and, until, you know, this past year it was canceled. And um, we always went as a family, which was really special. Um, after the first year, I said, okay, this is our, this is our family vacation every year, because we never really went anywhere or did anything. So um, I said, you know what, I want to commit, we're going to do this. Um, every year and it's you know for the weekend and at first we lived far away so we had to you know go and get a hotel and then we got a hotel just because we wanted to be you know there even even after we moved to Halifax we wanted to be there and be able to go back and forth and have a nap if we needed it or because it can get it can get pretty crazy if you're dancing there's a flash mob that we that we do um, and we've always enjoyed that and, and cosplaying. Um, oh, really? My, my daughter um, won a bunch of awards cosplaying because of her performance. Um, so the performance part of it. And uh, yeah, so we've had all sorts of fun, you know, following those pursuits. And my daughter has learned Japanese through, like, you no, know, not fluent yet, but um, through watching anime and really getting interested in the Japanese culture um, through anime. So she just started learning all the words and writing them on sticky notes on her wall and um, using all sorts of apps and just enjoying learning Japanese. Um, and on the side, she's learned, she's also, she also got into um, K-pop as well. So on the side, she's sort of learning a little bit of Korean as well. So we, we just kind of, when you let your kids go with their interests, they learn some really neat things. And um, so we often I just let them. I can see that they're actually following how you engage your life in general. It is, you're following your interests and they're following theirs as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, I mean, another interest that, you know, I've shared with my children is my my love of the fiber arts. So we um, you know, knit and um, I spin. So both kids have, have knit. They haven't really spun all that much, but they, they know how. Yeah, they've seen it in action. <laughs> and, um, yeah. And, you know, that kind of thing is great because that's, you know, cultural and yeah. also historical. Um, so everything you can learn from. Um, and that that's the biggest thing that I've learned throughout my you know, tenure as a homeschool mom, just that kids learn and it doesn't matter what they're doing. They learn from it because that's their job. You know, you can always come over to our house this summer. We are going to get two Nubian goats and I hear you can do something with uh, what I want to do is with their very high butterfat milk, make cheese. Um, And I am really bad at anything, knitting, any crafting whatsoever, really. Um, but my kids also watched in when we were in the Arctic for a summer, they watched um, a lady do spinning of muskox wool. I'm not sure if you call it wool, but very interesting to see. I mean, that was that was quite something to see muskox wool being woven into wool. But yeah, that's you're giving them your heart, really. And you're actually you're you're continuing your interest at the same time that you're showing them who you are. So maybe they don't love, you know, whatever it is, but they're actually seeing it in real time. So- yeah, yeah. 
Um, only, only, only sheep is called wool. Everything else is just fiber or whatever. It oh, okay. To be. But you can call, every, yeah. you can call everything fiber. Yes. Yeah, but so. um, yeah, we always wanted to get goats. Actually, you know, before we moved to Halifax, we lived on um, 50 acres and we had chickens, and yeah. I wanted to get goats. Um, I wanted to get some fiber goats, actually. Um, I, ra I raised <laughs> meat birds last year. I raised about 20 meat birds. And I think we ended up with 15 that my 12-year-old son refers to as chickens. Our chickens are in body bags in the freezer. He's now vegetarian now that we raised meat birds. But every time, like literally every time I pulled him out to eat, which was yesterday, I roasted a chicken. Everybody's like, yeah, I've eaten already. I'm like, do you know how much this cost me to raise these meat birds? Y'all eat chicken from every other place. But my actual own, my, my own home, they're not as interested. Go figure. Yeah, I think if they'd grown up that way, it would be normal. But, you know, when you grow up with faceless chickens, eating faceless chickens, and then they have faces. Yes. Right? Um, ours, ours, were, ours were pets that laid eggs, so it was a little easier. We didn't have meat, meat yeah, chickens. But, yeah, yeah but that was a real that. learning experience. That I'll never forget when my son came running in the house with an egg that yeah. had just formed in his hands that the chicken had laid it in his hands and the egg formed in his hands and he was just so excited I'll never forget that that is a pretty weird experience watching a chicken lay an egg it is just like you think <laughs> it is very strange it is, it is but yeah that was raising chickens um was one of the best things we did to um you know things that we learned from you know our kids know how, how chickens you know are born and how they live and you know um, all of our chickens all of us take care of them so, so. How, we're talking about taking care of chickens I'm going to transition in a very weird way how have you taken care of yourself over the last <laughs> <laughs> yeah, homeschool years yeah um you know, sometimes I wasn't, and, and I would realize the imbalance. I mean, I've never had, I, I'm, you know, none of us are super moms. We never have the balance perfect. Um, at, at some points, I wasn't taking care of myself the way I should. Um, and I think we've all been there. And, and you know, and it depends on um, your child's age, too. I mean, when your child is a infant or when you have an infant like you could have you know kids who are 12 and an infant if you're an infant you know your self-care is here somebody take care of the baby while I have a shower <laughs> yeah, that's true um but as your kids get older it gets easier because they can take care of themselves for like short periods of time and then and then really long periods of time and you know if you're if you're if you're teaching them to, you know, eventually, like at first you're sitting beside them the whole time. I mean, when, when they're seven, you can't expect them to do things on their own, but you can have a quiet time in the afternoon. You can say, okay, everybody, it's quiet time. Um, go to your room and have quiet time. And that can be whatever they want. Uh, and then you can have, you can have your quiet time nap if they're beyond naps. My daughter was really young when she stopped naps. Um, I think it was a year and a half and I was very upset. <laughs> Me too. That was my first child too. Yeah. To continue yeah. Turn the, they don't usually do things on schedule, like the way that we'd like them to. Welcome to parents. Yeah, she stopped napping at a year and a half. So yeah. I, I, a lot of people say, well, you know, homeschool the older one when your younger one naps. And I was like, but my younger one doesn't nap. What do I do? Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's just, you can say, hey, it's quiet time, and you yeah. can let them play quietly while you close your eyes for a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Or, or you know, um, you, you can put on uh, an audio book and let them listen while they play with Lego, and you get a little nap or, you know, engage in some self-care. Um, you can incorporate self-care at your home school, too. We had fun um, doing really elaborate uh 
designs for nail polish and yes. you know that was great self-care but it was also you know let's do art on our nails so there's things you can do together that are also self-care you don't necessarily you kind of need to give your head a shake and think of it in a different way because sometimes you, you just can't get that the alone self-care that you're thinking of when you're thinking of self-care sometimes you have to get it with your child so we talked earlier about sharing our interests with our children so knitting for me was very much self-care and I was teaching my children to do it and we were doing it together um and that can be a form of self-care so sometimes you're doing it by doing things you love with your kids but yeah so so you know sometimes you can do self-care with your kids you can take them out to lunch and you can go to a lunch together or a snack together you know yeah, we've get, done a lot of Starbucks get, get coffee and sit in the park yeah. <laughs> you know that kind of thing so sometimes it's really small things I mean now I could do bigger things you know because my kids are grown and almost grown so you know um I can I can pretty much tell them hey I'm, I'm going out with my uh, friend for a coffee have fun you know do your homeschool see you later <laughs> um because you know kids in grade 12 they can teach themselves they can learn themselves you don't have to be hovering over them all the time they definitely um, don't every, want you to be. <laughs> no, they really don't. They really don't want you to be. Um, yeah, so it's okay to realize you're going to be at different stages. And before you know it, you're going to be here where I am. Um, yeah. You know, at the end of your homeschool journey. And, you know, so you don't need to stress about it. You just need to find those little moments where you can and, try to try to engage in things for yourself like I'm really glad I went back to the theater when my daughter was three because I really I didn't really realize I was missing it but I I, when I went back I was like oh I missed this <laughs> so um you know if, uh, you can get that one two three nights a week kind of thing and arrange it as a family if you have older kids you know you know, I remember those days where I'd, my kids, my girls would say, Mom, I've set up a spa in the bedroom, all the nail polish, oh. and I'm going to like soak your feet for five minutes, and then I'm going to massage them, and then I'm going to do the pedicure, and then we'll do the manicure, and then we'll do, and even facials, and then we'll do the massage. And they did like full on massage for like 20 minutes or something with music and with little cucumber tea and all of that. And I'm like, uh, yeah, I will join you. <laughs> and they're like, but we want you to pay. I'm like, all right, I'll pay five dollars. <laughs> like five dollars would have been the expensive day. Most of the time, it was like two quarters for a massage. I'm like, yep, I'm in. <laughs> I will interrupt this normally homeschool schedule day for whatever spa you want. I love, I love those moments, and I don't have those. Just like you, my kids are all growing up and doing the independent thing. And it's, you know, kind of wistful because I don't think you start motherhood thinking that it's going to come to this place, but that's why it's so useful to establish the interests and, you know, doing the things that you love, like you're saying theater all throughout your homeschool journey, because you are going to say goodbye to each one of them. At least that's the goal, right? Mm -hmm. I don't really want to, but I also don't really want them to stay home forever either, I think. <laughs> Maybe that I reminds me of a really fun game that kind of felt like self-care. Um, my kids and I would practice writing writing letters, numbers, words, or messages on the, each other's backs and guessing what it was. Yes. And it was a very relaxing thing to do. And I think it uses neat parts of your brain as well. So I, I think that's a, that's a really fun thing to do and just like, and it's a very calm thing to do, you know, um, and also you know, they can practice their letters <laughs> when they're really little. So that's a lot of fun just with your finger writing on Especially your back. Around the just, shoulders yeah. and your cervical spine. <laughs> yeah. With massage yeah. oil. This letter's really down low on my, on yeah. my back now. Okay, and, now a bit higher. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that was a fun, really relaxing game. Um, 
and yeah it, that's that's just great that your kids have like spa I and mean, we, we we've done that quite a bit not as a spa but you know let's do each other's hair or um you know let's let's all let's all wear masks you know sit here with masks you know the facial masks, masks on our feet. Yeah. <laughs> not COVID mask yeah. yeah no 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 facial yeah. masks and you know it's and, different uh, kind of self-care yeah yeah and let's listen to an audiobook and have some fun have you had a few unexpected challenges along the way in your homeschool Hmm, that's a good question. I mean, well, I, at one point, um, my son was thinking, you know, maybe I should just go to school. I think I'd like to go to school. And that was um, in, you know, junior high, middle school area. And I, I, I just said no. <laughs> I just said no I, and he, he asked a bunch of times and I just say no I said honey I do not want to be in the principal's office every day because you're tired <laughs> you your yeah so, so did he uh, eventually people? end up going no no oh. um both my kids are really active uh so I just said no <laughs> now the neat thing was um my daughter was always curious about school um, so there's this curiosity, right? Because yeah. she had never been. And um, she got to have it satisfied, though. It, it's strange because um, this wasn't something that had happened in Ontario or I've ever heard anybody have happen. But um, the principals of the local public schools here really like inviting people to school. So she was invited um, into when she was in grade 10 to a grade 10 classroom and when she was in grade 11 to a grade 11 classroom for a day with one of her friends. Um, two different friends, two different schools. And yeah, um, so she got to, got to, you know, get her curiosity out, which was good. Um, but yeah, she came home and said, Mom, I, I couldn't just do the slits. It, it was really hard to stay still. <laughs> because, you know, she's my dancer, so she's constantly moving and it was very hard to just stay still in the classroom. My audience knows that I actually had the same challenge as you did. And it took, just like you said, I was like, uh, no, that's not what we do. And then eventually I said, okay, because I, for me, I saw that this is something that she needed for her own personality or her own journey. And so then when my second daughter went to high school, which is a, the second daughter I have, that is my third daughter, went to high school this year for the first time. It was a lot easier transition for me to allow her to go, go to high school. But she did end up going to the principal's office this, this week. Should I tell you that out loud? <laughs> she's a really good <laughs> kid, actually. But apparently was, she was sitting on a green space that she's not supposed to be sitting on. So her and her friends were, her friends were very worried. She's like, oh, it's fine. It's no big deal. And, you know, if you want to just blame anybody, just blame me then, because I encouraged you. So the principal asked her, I think you should, like, feel a little bit more worried right now. And she's like, oh, I'm fine. I know. I'll do whatever you want me to do after this. It's okay. I, I didn't mean to do anything wrong. And she was just very cavalier about it. But I must say I was surprised to hear that my daughter was called to the principal's office nonetheless, no matter what reason it was. Yeah. I, I think we have to trust ourselves as, as parents to know, like, I, I just knew that it was going to not be good, especially because I, I had been, um, we've taken international students since my son was three. And um, I had, I had really good knowledge of the local schools, um, the middle schools, junior high, whatever you want to call them. And yeah, no, <laughs> I, I chaperoned the school dances and, you know, with girls splashing their panties and wearing shirts as dresses and um, drinking vodka in the bathroom. And I was just, I wanted no part of that um, for my kids. Um, but not only that, but it just, um, you know, one of our students, he, he, and he was in English class and he kept getting written up because he was talking. And I was like, but he's talking English in English class and he's an international student. 
This is good. (laughs) (laughs) Why do you keep sending notes home all the time? Um, But yeah, it was just, it was crazy. Like he was a good kid and just like all these notes home constantly. And so I knew exactly what the school was like and I knew it was not going to work. Um, I knew, you know, hallways where you can only walk one way and things uh-huh. like that were not yeah, going to work. restrictions are a whole different level of restriction this year, too, because of COVID, even though they're probably... Yeah, and everybody, I think all the schools would have, all the schools would have that, the one-way halls and things like that. And if, if, if you know, the classroom you want to go to is one door back, how much sense does that make to a, a kid who's been homeschooled, you know? <laughs> Or having anyway, to, have you know, to go to the bathroom. Uh, yeah, that's different. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, all the things that I, I knew would not work for my son or my daughter, for that matter. And, yeah, so it was nice that my daughter got to see me firsthand. But it's okay to say no when you know it won't work for them. Because, I mean, you know all those other parents out there whose kids learn about homeschooling and ask their kids to homeschool, they're saying no. They're not guilty about it. They just say, no, of course not. And they won't go on with their life. So we don't have to be, feel really guilty that we're telling our children, no, if we don't want them to go to a public school or we don't think it's best for them. It's okay to say no. Um, I've learned actually yeah. as homeschoolers, we're looking for a community oftentimes, um, at least in the beginning, I really wanted a homogenous commu- community where everybody thought the same way and they had the same values that I did and they were homeschooling in the same way and, you know, all the same curriculum and you kind of crave that similar feeling, which you think you have when you're in a public school, although I don't really think you do, but I think you think you have it because you're all joining the same programs and the same grades and the same teachers and the same, et cetera. But when we're in a homeschool environment, we're very different and we know it. We are jumping off the mainstream thing to be our own independent homeschool families because we know it and we want to do what is the right thing for our family. And we're choosing to live by our values and choose to, you know, we flesh out who we are and why we're doing what we're doing very independently. So we need to honor each other and give um, you know, encouragement and allow space for everybody's doing things for different reasons. But that's the beauty of parenting in a homeschool environment is you do get to make all those choices for your family, um, for your reasons. And then of course, you're also paying attention to your kids along the way and, and factoring them in as well. Yeah, I mean, as homeschoolers, we're all in this together, because we're all homeschooling. It doesn't for me, it doesn't matter if somebody's an unschooler or a classical schooler, or Montessori schooler, or, or Waldorf schooler. Like, I, we're all in the big bucket of homeschoolers, and I love to hang out with all the different kinds of homeschoolers um, and welcome all the different kinds of homeschoolers. Um, I kind of groan whenever a new a new fringe Facebook group starts up um, because we really don't need to splinter all into among in directions. I, I love, I love when there's, you know, one big pot for all of us to hang in and, and encourage each other. Cause we're all going on a homeschool journey. If it, even if, I mean, obviously it's going to look different for each one of our children. Yeah. Yeah. And for us too, as homeschool moms, you know, that's kind of the thrust of the purpose of this con- um of this podcast is to really encourage the homeschool moms wherever they're at in whatever story, when whatever children that they have, that they could do this homeschool thing. And this homeschool thing looks very different in every one of our families. And over the course of time, as we grow as moms and we become more of who we were meant to be, because we actually don't go into this parenting thing, having everything figured, like you were saying in the beginning, there's no, super mom thing there's no perfect balance and there's no perfect way to do the the mom thing or the homeschool thing and we keep growing and they develop and it all looks different in everybody's family but it's all beautiful and it's all the way it should be Mm -hmm. yeah you have to do what's right for your family um it's like when your children when you're trying to figure out how to figure out your sleeping arrangements when your children are babies and toddlers and it's whatever works best for your family whatever gets everybody sleep is best for you so (laughs) everybody 
that's everybody in the family bed and do family bed. If that's everybody, you know, in separate bedrooms and everybody sleeps best that way, then do that. But um, it's the same thing with homeschooling. You know, you need to do what works for you. And know that you can you can work and homeschool because I have the entire time, um, albeit from home, uh, because we decided a long time ago before we even had children that I was going to work from home once we had kids. Um, so I've always worked from home, and uh, it's it's definitely something that's doable. And um, you know, it was at first I worked part time, and then as my kids got older, I worked full time. And so, you, you know, you can, you can do that, you know, seasons change and you can, you can do that if, um, if that works in your family monetarily, There's but you can also do, Go ahead. yeah, you can also do full time as well. Um, cause I know some, so many people who make it work. Uh, a lot of people write off homeschooling because they think they work full time. They can't homeschool. Although they've realized a lot of them since you know the pandemic, I've realized that yeah. oh well, everybody can if they you know they have to. They can make it work. So you so know whether you work you have for those people. Yeah, whether you work from home or you work out of the home, you can make it work because homeschooling doesn't have a schedule and homeschooling is flexible. And homeschooling doesn't take anywhere near the amount of time you think it does because it doesn't take eight hours a day. Um, almost all homeschool families you talk to, they're done by noon. And often they're only only homeschooling Monday to Thursday and taking Friday off. So it doesn't take long when you're working one-on-one -on -one with your child. Um, in a school situation, it's all, it's all school management. It's all pushing people around from place to place and checking boxes and it's it's about classroom management so at home it's it's a different thing and even if you have 12 children you can teach them all together um because you you know you can all study the greeks and then you know you can of course assign the eldest an essay if you're, you're doing that or ask them what they want to work on if you're you know unschooling but it, um yeah, you can you can homeschool on weekends, you can homeschool in the evenings, you can do whatever works for you. You can intentionally work shift work with your partner because then somebody's always home with their children. So tell me, you know, to at the end of my interview, I usually ask each homeschool mom a few fun questions. And one of them, which I have yet to hear anybody say something different. So I'm super curious what you're going to say. Um, I've been surprised, actually, that everybody says the same thing, but I shouldn't because my answer is the same as well. What do you usually do on a Friday night as a family? Um. Yeah, it kind of varies. Sometimes it's a Friday night, sometimes it's a Sunday night, but often it's pizza and a movie. Woohoo! Um, <laughs> right answer. I got to stop asking this question. Literally everybody answers the same <laughs> thing. <laughs> but but it, it depends because, um, you know, we have busy kids. So, I mean, now my usually we're not doing anything as a family on Friday nights because my daughter is either out with her friends or she's... Um, she's uh, dancing still uh until you know nine or ten at night so uh doing all sorts of dance classes or she's been you know working at the dance studio yeah so so it changes as you get older but we usually do pizza and a movie once a week um movies have changed into anime shows these, okay. these days um so it's like pizza and our weekly anime so so it has moved to sunday because we're watching um, Attack on Titan every week as it comes out. Um, so so that's a Sunday night. But yeah, Friday can be kind of, it, it depends what's going on. So what do, <laughs> so yeah, you have, pizza what do you have on your book stand right now that you're reading? I'm rereading, I'm, I have my book stand right now. I'm rereading the uh, Aragon series. Oh, really? Oh, so that's a solid science book. Yeah. Yes. Oh, I love the. I, I'm, I'm really into fantasy. So, uh, but yeah, I'm rereading this. I found since 
um, the pandemic, I was having a hard time reading. Uh, I couldn't get wrap my head around anything. <laughs> so I started reading all my favorite fantasy series. So now I'm onto, um, onto the Aragon series. So, but yeah, fantasy and sci-fi are big in our house. Um, my husband is a published author. He's got one short story published. My daughter and my son, my daughter is actively still writing. My son hasn't written recently, I don't think, but he used to write fantasy stories like crazy when he was younger. So I'm, I'm the nonfiction writer of the family. <laughs> I'm the odd one out. But yeah, I mean, my kids have always had so many interests that it's hard to, you know, fit other things in. So, you know, when you're when your daughter is dancing and doing theater and writing and reading and doing art all the time and self-studying foreign languages, you know, so that, that's a lot of, that's a lot of check marks. She's kind of taking care of a lot of things herself. Yeah, that, that's a fun way to do it, isn't it? When you really trust your kids, they really do show you amazing stuff. Like they're all doing differently. They're doing different things, but they really do a lot. So tell me, you have um, two sites, um, homeschooling in Nova Scotia, and it was geek schooling, right? Yes, and the URL is geekschoolingguide.com. So w- I think you told us where the origins of those names are. Obviously, homeschool in Nova Scotia is pretty clear. But <laughs> geek schooling, tell me about that one. You decided to come up with that name because you were following your interests. Is that right? Yeah, actually, um, well, a long time ago, uh, a friend of mine came up with with the geek schooling moniker. And I was like, hey, do you mind if I use that? Because she she dropped using it and she decided to go in a different direction. And I was like, hey, do you mind if I use that? Because that's what we're doing. And so I, I took Lori's idea and I started writing about, you know, what we were doing. And I'm working on a book geek schooling guide and uh, just about how you can do all these fun things in your homeschool around your child's interests instead of trying to tear them away from Star Wars and Lord of the Rings and trying to tear them away from video gaming and trying to tear them away from comic books and trying to get them to read real books instead of comic books They, they can learn from all these things that my children have um, and, and you can also, you can also point them in other directions. You can leave things out like, um, graphic novels that they, they can really learn about something else in, um, you know, anime like cells at work, which isn't for young children, by the way, okay. yeah. <laughs> there's some swearing in it. It looks like it's for young children, but it's not. But, um, if your children are in high school, uh, and you don't mind a little bit of swearing cells at work is all about the human body and it's animated. Uh, all the cells of the human body are animated and it's a great way to learn. Um, it, it's pretty hilarious and, and uh, my kids love it, but it's a great way to, for things to stick. But yeah, I mean, it, there's so many fun ways to learn from things kids love and letting them just go ahead and keeping learning is, is one way of geek schooling. And the other way is just going, Hey, you know, let's turn our living room into a TARDIS and have, you know, let's do Doctor Who week. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that is the freedom that we have as homeschoolers. Tell me what, yeah. tell me what kind of resources or what kind of um, supports that you have online available for people. Um, well, on my website, um, if you go to geekschoolingguide.com slash mini dash course, that's geekschoolingguide.com slash mini dash course, you'll find um, a mini course on geek schooling and following your kids to like directed learning and enjoying uh, learning that way. Um, so that's uh, one thing. And also I have um, on my geek schooling in the shop. I have a digital organization guide for homeschoolers. Oh, okay. So just to get you digitally organized and organized, because I found um, 
you know, I'd get all these ebooks and all these great things. And sometimes it was an advance. Sometimes it was like, Ooh, this will be great when they reach high school. And then you completely forget it's on your computer. Yeah. So you can, you can search and organize by topic and grade and everything and keep a spreadsheet of what you're doing. And that's one of the tools that's in, in the toolkit. So um, yeah. So where can we two. find you online then? Is it on Facebook or your separate website for either of those names? Yeah, you can find um, Geek Schooling on Pinterest and Instagram and Twitter and Facebook and all the things. <laughs> so um, it's usually just Geek Schooling. Um, for one of them, it's Geek geek underscore schooling but everything else is geek schooling so and for those that are fine. for those that are in nova scotia homeschooling in nova scotia is a separate website as well yeah um if you're in, ho- in nova scotia and you want to learn how to homeschool um you can go to homeschooling scotia.com slash getting dash started and you can download um a getting started checklist to bring you through how to start homeschooling Well, thank you for joining me today. I really actually am glad that I finally got to meet you face to face because you've been helping me a lot this year. It's been a real pleasure to get to chat with you officially today. So thanks for joining me. Thank you so much for inviting me, Teresa. It's been a pleasure. And thank you for joining me today. I'd like to hear more about who you are, so come on over to my Facebook or Instagram page, Homeschool Mama Self Care. I've recently opened a Homeschool Mama support group with the intention of supporting and encouraging you along your homeschool journey in hopes that you'd also want to support and encourage other homeschool mamas too. And while you're there, you can check out the preview of my new book, Homeschool Mama Self Care Nurturing the Nurturer. I've been talking about this book for more than a year, but it is about to be released mid-February. I am so excited to share it with you. I am hoping that it will bring encouragement and support to you on your homeschool journey. And in honor of that launch, I will be having a series of live interviews with other homeschool mamas who have been there, done that, and are helping other homeschool mamas on their journeys today. And I've got a self-care package as a giveaway in honor of this book launch that you will appreciate. It's not just swag that is put into a self-care package that nobody really cares about. This is some pretty cool stuff that I myself love. So you can find all the show notes and the links of this episode found at www.capturingthecharmedlife.com. Until next time, I wish you and your kids a charmed week. Unless you're having one of those days, then I hope you can turn all your challenges into your charms.